Hi there, I'm Alex Feisley, and today I'm going to give you a walkthrough of NetMaker version 0 0.10. So we released this just a few days ago, and we're going to be walking through how to install it, how to set it up with a few different nodes, and what the different features look like. So along the way, I'll be referencing the GitHub page a little bit. I'll also be referencing our documentation. So you can find those at docs.netmaker.org or our github slash gravital slash netmaker. So feel free to check that out. So we're going to start by installing onto an AWS EC2 instance. And we're using a micro instance of Ubuntu 20.04. Uh, we do recommend that as the operating system. And we just need to make sure a few ports are open. So I've already provisioned this instance and we can check out uh, our security ranges. We have ports 80, 22, 443, and a range of UDP ports that will be used by WireGuard. So this number should equate to the number of networks you plan on using. So if you're only planning on deploying one network, you really only need one port and then up subsequently from that. But it's usually good to up open a range just in case you plan on deploying a few additional networks. Uh, 80 is used by Let's Encrypt just for requesting the certificate. So if you are requesting, uh, or if you're using your own custom certificate, uh, rather than using the default caddy installation, you actually don't need this. So really what you need at the end of the day is you need to be able to SSH to the machine, you need some ports for WireGuard, and you need 443 open. But that should be it. The rest of the communications are going to travel over the WireGuard tunnels, so we shouldn't need additional access beyond that. And that includes our private DNS and our MQ communications. Okay, so let's go ahead and get going. We're going to use the getting started in five minutes tutorial here that we have just in the base readme of our repository. And it's really just one line of code here. So let's give that a go. So over here, I'm going to SSH to our EC2 instance. I'm gonna to switch to root. And I'm just gonna run this one command here. So let's give that a go. And what it's going to do is check to see if we have all of our packages that we need in order to get going. Once it does that, it's going to set up a few uh, default parameters, which are editable. And then it's going to pull everything down and spin up Docker Compose. So as you can see, it's already gotten through all that. Uh, and it's now up and running. This may take a lot longer depending on if your machine is smaller or larger or has all of the dependencies needed to get going. It also did a couple other additional things here. So it set up a default network for us um, and it configured the server as an ingress gateway. We found these are some settings that a lot of people like to have by default and also gives some default install instructions in case you just wanna get going and you don't wanna go to um, the UI. So you could get going with your network without having to do anything at all really. Um, so there's a couple optional configurations we could have added here. Um, so for instance, we could have deployed a hub and spoke VPN. Um, so that would have basically been an additional network called VPN, which configured the server as both an ingress and an egress gateway to the internet. And then you could use our external clients. So basically, uh, if you think of like NordVPN or any of those typical standard VPNs you use for accessing the internet, that would be what this default setting does. Uh, you can also, of course, put your email address in so that your certificates are attached to your um, email address. So there are a couple other options we could have done there, but really most of the stuff you can do from the UI anyway, this just automates a couple of initial setup steps. So now that that's installed, first off, let's just confirm that by doing a Docker PS and seeing what we have here. So we have our UI, we have core DNS, we have MQ broker, we have our server, and we have the caddy reverse proxy. And that should be everything we need. So let's take a look at 
our server logs and it looks like it's up and running. Uh, there are a few logs here. We're gonna need to clean these up in a future iteration. You'll see maybe a couple like these that aren't actually errors. Uh, they look a little bit like it. Um, so for instance, could not set peers. This is because we don't have any peers yet. We haven't added any peers to the network. Same thing here, error external retrieving, error retrieving external peers. That's because we haven't created any ext clients yet. So let's just go over the server to see what we're talking about there. So I grabbed from that output the address of our server. I could also cat the Docker Compose that got generated there and see what that looks like. Actually, a better way, we can cat the caddy file that got generated and we can see the dashboard addresses right there. So one other thing worth noting, what gets deployed here by default is the contained version. And what that means basically, if you take a look at our compose files, we have several here. Contained is the default. So this is identical to just the Docker compose right here. This is our default configuration setting. And this has our interface and all those settings contained inside of Docker. So what that means is if we run WG here or WG show, however you tend to do that for WireGuard, you're not going to see anything. But if we look inside the container, we do see the interface. So the interface is contained inside of Docker and we run port forwarding so that everything is all nice and clean. And the benefit here is you can run this side by side with other applications on your server and it won't hurt them or um, you know cause any conflicts with network settings. Um, in addition, a benefit is we can spin this thing down and up very easily and regenerate our interfaces as opposed to if you run with host networking when you run docker compose down and back up again, if you're, for instance, restarting your instances, you'll still have the WireGuard interfaces on the host because it won't be able to clean that up automatically. So depends on what you need. If you want your interfaces to be on the host, which you might want for a variety of reasons, for instance, treating this as a bastion server for your whole network, you might want to run with this host networking Docker Compose instead of the contained one. And then we have a few others here, for instance, no caddy. This is the same Docker Compose, but without the caddy proxy, which means you'll be responsible for setting up your own proxy. And that can include something like Trafic, which we have in our community docs here. Um, one of our users was kind enough to set that up. You can also look in our documentation for how to set up NetMaker using Nginx. So if we go over here and look at advanced server installation, there's a setup with Nginx as well. So you don't have to use Caddy. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Now looking back into this Compose, uh, a couple other options there, no DNS. So this uh, just deploys the server, but without the core DNS server, if for whatever reason you don't want the private DNS features, of course, you can always just disable those within NetMaker and that's fine as well. So a few different options. And if you're really looking to get deep into it, we have an entirely annotated compose file here. So you can go in here and see what every option looks like and get an idea for what you're setting. Cause there is a lot of stuff in there, a lot of different settings for setting up your environment that you might be interested in changing. Okay, so getting back into it, let's actually check out our NetMaker server. So one more time, let's cat that caddy file and see that we have that dashboard link there and we'll go to it. And the first screen we get to, it asks us to create an admin user. Now, this would look slightly different if we had uh, use OAuth provider to log in. Now we could set this up with OAuth, which you can also find in our documentation. We're just doing the quick install here, so we're not going through that for now, but we have this integrating OAuth section for instance, using GitHub, Google, 
or Microsoft Azure AD, which could also hook up with your on-prem LDAP uh, if you have it configured that way. So this allows you to externalize your authentication, but by default, we'll just be doing simple auth. So let's create our user. And this will create an admin on the server, and then we can log in with it. So here we are, and we're at the NetMaker dashboard, which is where you go by default. And this basically sums up the different sections we have available. So you'll see we have a dashboard, we have the networks page, the nodes page, the graphs page, access keys, external clients, DNS, and then a couple other things like the docs. This is just a link to our documentation. Um, this is something about our current user, so we can change our password if we want to, and also users management here as well. So let's walk through each of these and talk about what is in NetMaker that you have access to use to manage your network, starting with the dashboard page, which just really links out to the other aspects and gives you some high level information. So for instance, you can see some quick links to some different sections here. You can see your access keys. You can see how many external clients you have running. This is really just the number of each one that you have. And you can link out to it, or you can just use the sidebar. So it's just a quick view. And the first one we're gonna go to is networks. So every network in NetMaker starts with a network. This one was created by default by our script, but if we didn't use the script, there would be no networks in here at all. In fact, it would be empty. And as a quick example of that, let's just delete this network and start from scratch. So now we have no networks here and we actually have to create one to get going. So what do we do? We go to create networks and we have to fill out some settings. And we have a few settings here, which we can choose to autofill if we want or we could just fill it out manually. So this gives you a few options for different private IP address ranges and network names, and it does set UDP hole punching on by default, which you may or may not want switched on. So talking about that a little bit more, let's call it MyNet to get going. And this network range looks pretty good, but for the purposes of demonstration, let's make it 10.1.1 just so it's really easy to see what's going on there. And this could be whatever you want. I know a lot of people like the 100 address space, so you can do that. There's really no limit here. This could be 172. You could really even use a public address space if you want. Uh, what you want to avoid is conflicting with public network namespaces. So if you want to do that, it's probably best to use a .10 or a 100 address range. So we're going to get going with this. A couple other of these settings, you're probably not going to touch this one. So I'd best leave that off unless you're doing a very advanced thing, which would be basically operating from inside a data center um, or some other environment where everything is already on a private network and you're connecting things inside of a private network which is you know, a lot more rare. You can also set on dual stack networking. So you specify an IPv6 address range, and then you get both IPv4 and IPv6. But we're just gonna start with this. It's real simple, and let's go ahead and create that. So now we have MyNet, which we can click on that and see those settings. And there are some additional options here, which you might notice. So one is the default listen port, this is the listen port actually that the nodes get. And important to note here is the listen port here is actually gonna get ignored because we have UDP hole punching turned on. And what this means is the port is randomized when each node starts up. So if we turn that off, it'll use this. This will be the port that each machine uses for NetMaker. And actually those machines, if they're in multiple networks, will iterate up. So let's say, for instance, I'm on uh, some random VPS and I connect into the network. The first network I join is going to be 51821. The second one will use 51822 and iterating up like that. We use 51821 because 51820 
is the default WireGuard port. So we figured to avoid conflicts with a lot of those default installations of WireGuard, we just go one above that. So we're gonna leave UDP hole punching on and a few of these other options you might wanna note. Uh, most notably would be default MTU. We found that 1280 tends to be a good number. Some people might wanna adjust this upwards to something in the 1400 range. Um, some people might even wanna put it downwards. We found a lower MTU can work well with Kubernetes. Um, this is the maximum transmissible unit. Um, so you might need to play with that depending on if packets are going through. And what you're gonna see on your interface side is you'll have a handshake but you're not able to ping. And if that's happening, it tends to be an MTU issue, something to think about. And this can also be altered at the individual node level, which actually tends to be a better option anyway. So we didn't change anything here. This is all pretty standard stuff. So we're gonna keep that the same and we're gonna just go back. And so that's really the networks page. The next page down from there, after you have your networks page is your nodes page and your nodes are the machines inside of your network. And you'll see here, we already have one in my net, which is called NetMaker1. This is our server. So if we go back here once more, this is NetMaker1 right here. This is the interface created on the Docker container for NetMaker. And the reason we do that is because we try to push communication over the WireGuard interface where possible, which means the server must be a part of all networks. So what we do is add it to the network with the last available IP address in the range provided. So we did 10.1.1.0 .1 slash 24 and the last available address is that 254. So that's what NetMaker takes and that becomes a reliable address that all of the machines on the network can access. So we can look at this and see some of these settings here. Uh, the NetMaker node specifically is kind of special. So you'll notice you can't delete it. Uh, you cannot delete the server node because it must exist on the network. And a lot of these settings, uh, it's not gonna let you change. So for instance, the IP address has to stay the same. And yeah, that's it's really just a very static place for all of your nodes to reach out to. So we want to add some nodes into this network. Let's go ahead and do that. So I have here a digital ocean machine. I also have Linode and I have AWS once more. So let's start with AWS, why not? And the command's gonna be the same for all of them. And what we need is an access key. So access keys are how we access the network. We go down here and we choose our network and we say create access key. We give this a number of uses, which is basically the number of times you can register with the network using the key. So we only have three machines. We should only need to use this three times. Let's give that a shot. If it fails, you might need to give it an extra use or two or create a new key. And then you get this list of weird random strings. So this is really a bunch of ways that you can access the network. These top ones you can usually ignore. These are the ones you wanna pay attention to down here. So basically you have install commands. And so you have one for Linux, FreeBSD and Mac. So this is basically a shell script that will run and install the net client on your machine. You also have a Docker command you can run to join as a Docker container. And then you also have a Windows PowerShell script for joining Windows. Lastly, you have the manual join command. And this assumes that you already have the net client on your machine. So if you've joined a network already using one of these other commands, you'll actually have the net client command available on your machine, and then you can just call net client join to join an additional network. And if you're doing it manually, if for whatever reason the scripts aren't working, what you wanna do is go 
to github.com and look in our releases. So you'll see this is our latest version. And if you click on it, here are all of our binaries. So you can actually just click on one of these guys and download it and put it on your machine depending on what you're running. So you'll see we have a variety here for all the different types of ARM-based machines, for uh, Mac, for FreeBSD, in all different types of ARM machines, uh, the EXE for Windows, and we even have the NetMaker server binary for if you're running a bare metal server. But yeah, this basically should encompass most of what you need to get going with the client. So on our AWS machine, we're just gonna copy this install command and run it. So here we have, it curls the script, it runs the script directly in the foreground with a couple of environment variables, including just the version and the key, and that should be enough to join. Now, one more thing before I do that, let's take a look at this access token. This is what the access token actually is. It has the location of the server, it has the key, and it has the network you're joining. And that's actually really all it is. Uh, we're probably gonna make this key or this token shorter in the future because we don't actually need all of these bits here. We don't need these duplicate addresses. These are kind of legacy things. All we really need is the key we need the gRPC location, the API location, and we need gRPC SSL, whether that's on or off. So that's whether you're using HTTP or HTTPS, basically. Um, yeah, and the network you're joining. So that's all that does. You could run a manual install command. So it looks something like this, net client join, and you'd have a key, which would be this value. You'd have a network, which would be this value. You'd have an API server, or actually you'd really just need API con, and that'd be this value. And gRPC con, which would be this value. And so on and so forth, putting on in all these values, and then you just run the join command. But rather than that, we can just run net client join with a token, it'll decode those values for us and join the network. Now, before we can do that, we need the correct client version. So that's why we run this curl command. So running this, it checks to make sure our dependencies such as WireGuard are installed. It grabs the client, it joins the network, it starts the interface, and then here we are, we're in the network. So looking at that one more time, we are able to ping the server now over this private address. And now we have the first node in our network. So let's join two more machines. We have Linode here. Go ahead and join that. And we have DigitalOcean. And for this one, I'm just going to run the Docker version just to do something a little bit different. And here we go. Oh, <laughs> looks like we already had that Docker container name. And let's see, let's make sure WireGuard's not on there. So it's not. And we should just be able to run that once more. There we go. And now that's running. And it seems to have started. And if we look, this one runs on the host level, so we actually do get the interface there. Cool, so looking at this, the hope is we're able to ping everything, which it looks like we are. And that's about it. Uh, basically, by default, all of our machines are created as a net mesh network. And what does that mean? What is a mesh network? Well, we've got all our machines here. We've got dot one, dot two, and dot three. 
and take a look here. This is a mesh network. We have four machines, the server and the three nodes, which are all communicating directly. And so each machine oops, has all of those nodes in it and are able to ping each other. And the great thing about this is the NetMaker server keeps it all up to date. Whenever a node changes or a port changes, the server will push out those changes to your machine and keep them updated. That is what, if we go back here, that is what MQ is for. So we have this message queue uh, client server broker thing going on where uh, all of our nodes subscribe to receive updates about the network. So let's say, for instance, I'm going to change Linode's address to 22 rather than dot two. What happens? Well, first of all, the server receives this update. It pushes that update first to Linode so that it knows it has to update its interface. So if we go over to wherever it is, Linode, and we look under IPA, we can see it updated that interface to use a dot 22 address. If we go over to our other peers, we can see now that in their peers list, oh, this one didn't get the update yet. Um, sometimes it can take a couple seconds to go through. Uh, here, uh, looks like that one didn't get through yet. So sometimes we have to wait a second for that peer update to go through. Uh, but once that does, they should be good to go. So let's try actually pushing another update there. I'm going to change, I'm gonna change another node as well. Let's make AWS, let's make that dot 11. So then we have two that are now updated. And let's see if AWS comes through in time. So if we run WG there, oh, that's on our server of course, so that one doesn't have the update. WG here. This is the AWS machine. So if we run a IPA on here, this one is now .11. If we check out Linode, this one now has the .11. Okay, so that one's going through. And let's get one more. Yeah, I think we should be good here. Okay, cool. So we got the 22 and the 11 there now and those should be pingable. Okay. Cool. So basically we can push out updates to all of our machines via the UI. The other nodes will receive those updates and the whole network will stay in sync. Give or take a few seconds. If it doesn't go through immediately, sometimes if there's some sort of network interruption, it can take up to five minutes, at which point it'll do like a force push. Um, so if you don't see it immediately, you might wanna wait. Um, but typically it'll go through nearly instantaneously. Um, and then the one other thing you might wanna do if you're troubleshooting, you can run net client pull on machines and that will actually just reset the interface locally based on the latest from the server or net client check-in which is a little bit more subtle it'll check for changes on the network side before it changes anything this one is like a hard reset this one's like a soft reset i guess so those are really your options there for troubleshooting real quick and one other thing we can look at here is what is actually running. So when you join a network, you have a systemd service set up on um, Linux and it's launchd on uh, Mac and there's a different daemon on Windows uh, and a different one in FreeBSD. But basically it sets up a daemon on the system. So if we run systemctl status net client, you can see that that's running there. So you can also run journal ctl dash 
fu net client and get follow the logs there as it's updating. And that's really where your logs are going to get updated. So um, keep that in mind. Now that is the basics of setting up a mesh network with NetMaker. So we created this mesh. What else can we do with it? There's a couple very interesting things actually. So for one, let's talk about an Ingress gateway. So an Ingress gateway is basically an inlet into the network. So we have this flat, I guess think of it like a, like a, like a switch or a, an inward based router where you have traffic coming into this network and it can come in via one of these nodes and you can choose whichever one you want. Typically you want it to be a public facing node, which luckily all of ours that we're testing on are. Um, so how do you do that? Well, let us choose one of these guys. Let's make, for instance, let's take this uh, Linode guy. I think this is probably be a good one. And let's make this, uh, actually, we're gonna take the server and do it. The server is really a good one and a good reliable one to make an ingress gateway, which is why we'll do it there by default, because the server should be in a public place anyway, which makes it great for this. And then it acts as a good inlet to your network. So to create an ingress gateway, I just gotta click that button and then look at that. Now it's an ingress gateway, but that doesn't mean anything on its own. How does traffic actually get into the network over this thing? Well, for that, we need to create what's called external clients. So what is an external client? Well, first we gotta create some. Um, you can change these names if you want. Um, but basically these are client configurations that get generated and then can be downloaded or scanned. So you can take these QR codes and scan them from, for instance, the WireGuard app, because what these are, are raw WireGuard configurations. So let's say I download one of these guys and let's open that to see what it looks like. This looks pretty familiar to anyone who's used WireGuard. This is just a simple WireGuard config file that can be used on any machine that supports WireGuard. It has only one peer, which is our Ingress gateway. And if you notice the allowed IPs, it's the allowed IPs for the full network range. What happens when that traffic hits the NetMaker server for any address in the network. So whether that's DigitalOcean on 1.1.3 or Linode on dot 22 or AWS on dot 11, it will flow through the NetMaker server and hit one of these nodes. So now we have all of these external clients that are able to hook into the network and yeah, if you don't want them to have access anymore, you just delete them and then they're no longer on the server. So we can actually see that here. Let's pull up AWS. So if we look, it's again only inside of NetMaker and we can see these are actually our two external client configs which have not been used yet, so they don't have a handshake or anything or an endpoint even. It's just sitting there waiting for them to connect. Now, a couple notes about the Ingress gateway to keep in mind. Um, if the Ingress gateway config changes, these will become invalid because these are just static files. You will have to regenerate and re-download these static files if anything here changes. So for instance, the address or the port, those are the big things. If the address or the port changes of your gateway, you're gonna to need to update your configs. So keep that in mind. You really want this to be a static machine that is reliable. Okay, so that is an ingress gateway. 
What else do we have? Well, besides ingress, there is egress. What is an egress gateway? Well, if an ingress gateway is to bring traffic into your network, an egress gateway is to take traffic out of your network to somewhere else. And that can take a couple different forms. If we go back to our docs here, we actually have a tutorial on egress gateways, which actually we also have one on ingress. Um, this talks a lot more about it, but basically what we're doing is taking traffic from our network, routing it through the egress gateway, and that reaches anywhere else that that egress gateway has access to. You can think of two very different use cases for this. So one would be a standard VPN. Now these are the standard VPN address ranges. If you post these in your egress gateway, you will create basically a gateway to the internet. So all of your nodes will use these address ranges and access them via your gateway. So if you're trying to create like a NordVPN type situation, that's how you do that. Now, the more typical use case for an egress gateway on NetMaker would be for something like accessing a subnet that's not available easily from the other ones. So for instance, on Kubernetes, and we also have Kubernetes documentation, on Kubernetes, we would actually use an egress gateway for multi-cluster networking. So if we take a look at this, um, we actually set up egress gateways to make traffic work between clusters. Uh, but we don't have Kubernetes here. We actually just have a couple, uh, couple of machines. So what we're gonna do instead is make it an egress gateway to uh, a local network on one of these nodes. So let's say for instance, we have some resources running on AWS. Let's say it's over this uh, local range here on AWS. So all we have to do is say, all right, it's on ETH zero. It's, uh, it's on this address range. So it's a slash 20. So what do we do here? We're going to create a gateway. And if we go back to NetMaker, we could make this to anything. So I'm already on AWS here and I create the gateway. So we put in our range there and we say it's ETH zero. And yeah, if you know that range, that's basically it and you create it. That range is now accessible to your whole network. So when these nodes try to reach 172.31.92. whatever, it's going to reach it via this AWS gateway. So if you have a database running there or some website or something, that's how they can hit it. Another thing to keep in mind is if you're running on a home network, that might be the way you access it. So let's actually simulate that real quick because you can run multiple networks here and I'm doing this on the fly. So let's call this home net. And again, we'll leave UDP hole punching on and we create that. Now I'm gonna just pretend one of these is a home lab. So let's give that job to Linode. We're gonna pretend Linode is on our home network. Um, so we're on home net, we create an access key. We are just gonna give it one use here. And actually we don't even need to do that. So what we could do instead, should be able to delete that. Um, you can just click create and that'll give you a one use key. So I just wanted to show you that. Um, but if we go back to Linode, let's do a net client join. And now it's in an additional network. So if we run WG again, we actually have two networks now, MyNet and HomeNet. And we could actually do this like that and pipe that into JQ. That looks a little bit better. Oops, don't have JQ there. JQ 
JQ is just a tool to format um, JSON if you're not familiar with it. So it just makes it look a little prettier. So here we can see the nodes available for HomeNet, which is just the server, and also the ones for MyNet. So what can we do with that? Uh, so if we look now at HomeNet, there's really just two nodes here. What could we do here? Let's say we're hosting a, uh, let's say we're hosting a website or a game server inside of our local network. This could be this could be where that machine is. So this could be our game server, or it could be something else in the network. So let's say my home network range is 192. Uh, so I make this an egress gateway. And there we go. It could also be to just a single machine inside of that network. So let's say that it's on dot 32 in there for whatever reason. Let's say our, we have a game server running on dot 32. So we can actually just edit this range, make that dot 32 slash 32. Maybe that's why I thought, thought of that. Or let's say there's two machines you want access to. We could, excuse that, simply take this. Let's make that two ranges. We've got one on dot 32 and one on dot 35. So let's check that out now. Go back to our graph, and we now have two machines accessible via this gateway. Now we still have this NetMaker server here, which is in a public location, which could let us do something like create an egress gateway to our home network. So going back to our nodes here, let's go to home net. Let's make the NetMaker server an ingress to our home net and then we want to access it from our laptop on the road. We create a config file like that, we scan our QR code, and now that machine inside of our home network is accessible via the gateway. All right, so that was a whole lot. Um, one last thing I want to show to you. Let's switch back to MyNet. Now we've used a lot of different features here. The one we did not touch on is the relay server. What is a relay server? A relay server is a way to access machines that are not easily accessible. So if we go to our nodes and take a look, all of these nodes are easily accessible, but let's uh, pretend something else here. Let's pretend that our node here, Linode, which let's say it's simulating our home machine once again, is stuck behind a CGNAT or a uh, 4G LTE router a double NAT, there are certain situations in which you'll set up your network and say, huh, I can't reach this machine. What's going on there? And you can't figure it out. Now, an easy way to fix that is to take one of your public machines and make it a relay. What does that mean? Let's take this digital ocean machine and turn it into a relay. So we'll select Linode there and create. Now, when we go back to our graph, our Linode is now behind DigitalOcean. So when NetMaker or AWS try to access Linode, it'll do it through this relay server. So this is about as complex as a network as we could possibly create. Actually, we can make it more complex because an egress gateway can exist behind a relay. So if you have a CG NAT and you have a machine behind that with a Linode, you could make that also into an egress and say, all right, this guy's gonna be an egress as well. And um, you know, it's on ETH1 and it's 172.168.1.5 or one well, zero well, it could be anything really it could be multiple ranges but you know uh, let's say we're adding in this other one 
and now our graph gets even more complicated. Um, but yeah, you can kind of get the idea for uh, the extreme amount of network control here, where you go from something really simple, which is a pure mesh, into this really, really complex uh, network where you route via relays into local networks and whatnot. And you can visualize that all via this graph feature. So let's remove all this stuff and take it back to where it was before. So I remove my egress gateway. I remove my relay. And then I remove Usually you're not gonna to wanna to do all the stuff at once because this is gonna be pushing a lot of network updates to everything. Um, you can get rid of these EXT clients. And what we're left with, and we've still left that ingress gateway there, but you get the idea. We're back to this very, very simple mesh network where everything just talks directly together. So, Last couple things, because we didn't walk through quite everything. Um, let me just bring up one other scenario that'll take about two minutes to go through. So let's say you're making a VPN, because um, we talked about making a standard VPN. How would you do that manually? I'm going to create a new network. I'm going to call it uh, VPN. Um, let's say we want you to be whole bunching off this time. And let's give it our address range and create. So we now have a VPN network. If we go to our nodes for VPN, we just have one. We don't actually need any extra nodes here. All we're gonna do is create an ingress gateway and an egress gateway on the same machine. So we're gonna tell it to go out over ETH to zero. And remember that long list of IPs here? Let's take that. This is not gonna look pretty in the graph view, but this will work. So we post this in here. This is basically all the standard public address ranges. Create that. This machine is now both an egress and an ingress. We go over here, we create some external clients for it. So all these guys can now access the internet via the NetMaker server, treating it as a VPN gateway, similar to how you do it for NordVPN or any of these other guys. So let's see what that graph looks like. Does not look good, looks kind of crazy. <laughs> Definitely a lot harder to, to see what's going on there. Um, but yeah, that is a way to access the access the internet through NetMaker. So it's got a lot more co complicated here. If we go back to our NetMaker server, which I believe is back here, we do another exec. Yeah, we've now got three networks on that interface. We've got all sorts of stuff going on, um, but it can handle it. It can handle, you know, a ton of arbitrary networks. Okay, a couple more things to look at here. So one thing just worth mentioning, if you've got an access key and you don't wanna use it anymore, um, you should probably delete it. So let's say I make one here. I join some networks with it. Um, and I'm not using it anymore. You should probably delete those just so they're not usable anymore. No more nodes can join your network. Um, if you want to join a ton, uh, we don't have the concept of an unlimited key. You can make this like 9999. Um, so it's nearly unlimited. But yeah, then you could use this in stuff like automation. So you can join tons and tons of nodes for months and months without running out of keys. Um, the alternative to this is creating a network with manual signup. So let's check this out here. Allow node signup without keys. So if you enable this, nodes can actually join your network without a key. They need to know where the server is still, but once they join, they will join in pending state. And then you can approve them from the UI. Um, while we're in this, screen as well. One other thing worth noting, you can switch on and off UDP hole punching for your whole network with this switch. This is very important to note because sometimes UDP hole punching, depending on your configuration, isn't going to work. Uh, it really depends on how strictly your v, um, server environment is. Um, in other situations, you might want it to just be more static, so you want to turn it off. So. Keep in mind you can switch between the two if uh, connectivity doesn't seem to be working so well. 
Just keep that option in mind. Okay, um, let's move over to DNS. So, if we go to home net, my net, that's probably a good one to look at. Uh, all right, so we have a list of default DNS here. Let's check out, hopefully this is working. Sometimes It really depends on how strictly the machine is set up. Um, so we should have an NS lookup here. Okay, yeah, so that one, that machine, it looks like it wasn't able to get the DNS for. Um, let's check out Linode, see if that one's going either. These might, guys might be missing resolve CTL, in which case, um, yeah, okay, so that one didn't get it either. But uh, what's worth noting here is basically just, we are setting up um, private DNS for your network and these are all entries in core DNS, which become accessible um, to your nodes by setting resolve CTL, and you can put in custom entries there. Um, yeah, so let's call this like API server.mynet, and you could have this be even anything on your egress range as well. So let's say you have something on like 172, uh, then you can set it up like that, and that's just some custom DNS for your network. Uh, becomes accessible uh, in addition to all of these default addresses. So there's something additional you can get there. And yeah, I think I'll have to do an updated one just on DNS specifically, since I did not configure my network for it appropriately. Uh, so we'll get to that some other time. And last thing to look at here is users. So you can create additional users. I'll create one called Alex, and you give it an amount of network access. So let's say I only want him to be able to access the VPN network, create a user there, and let's log out and log in as Alex. Doesn't like my password, because password is password. Um, and yeah, we only have this VPN network network here. So we can partition our ability to access networks. This guy doesn't have access to the user's page because he's not an admin. So if I log back out here, log back in, now I can go to this user's page, I can delete this guy. And you know, you could create one that has super user access, so that would be making them an admin. Uh, you can give them access to whichever networks you want. And yeah, that gives you a good level of user management. In the future, we're gonna go level down here and give additional user access, but yeah, that's basically the idea. So, to recap, we did a lot of stuff here. We created several networks. Um, we granted a lot of access between those networks, uh, configured them, went through all the settings about here. Oh, here's one other setting before I forget. If you're setting up something like, uh, like uh, ext clients, one thing you might want to do is set default ext client DNS. So this could be 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. It could also be the private address of your NetMaker server. Um, but yeah, this will give them DNS uh, by default. Otherwise, that's going to be left blank and it's going to use the DNS of the machine. So really worth keeping in mind for that one. Um, yeah, so besides the networks, after we went through those, we talked about nodes. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about is the status page. So if something goes wrong with one of your nodes, it'll enter a warning state, and then eventually an error state if it goes even more wrong. So worth keeping in mind for that. Um, okay, and then what else we talked about the graph page and how you can manage everything from that we talked about access keys and how to create and delete those ext clients how to create and delete those and use them via the qr code and the download client configuration once more just to keep it in mind these are pure wireguard configs so you would use this configuration file exactly like you would with any standard WireGuard 
thing. So if you need to do that, you know, look up fireguard.com. You know, it has a lot of good quick start information about how to use a file. Um, this is like basically you're going to use WG Quick here. So, you know, look into how to use WG Quick uh, if you're not familiar with WireGuard. And yeah, there's DNS. And of course, there's the links to our docs. So, all of the stuff I went over, all of this is in the documentation. And we're building out this more every single day. It's got a lot of information about how our architecture works, how to install in a ton of different ways, what ingress is, what in egress is, how relay works. Um, we have special docs for Kubernetes. And yeah, I think that goes through all of it. We've got some specific tutorials about different use cases. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And other than that, uh, I uh, hope you look forward to using NetMaker and we'll try to produce more of these videos, more specific different use cases as we go forward. We're planning to get a lot more material out there so that people have a good sense for how to use NetMaker. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed. So have a good one.